Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to The Holodeck is Here, Designing for Room Scale VR. <laughs> My name is Alex Schwartz, and I'm the CEO and Chief Scientist of Alchemy Labs. And I'm Devin Reimer, CTO, Chief Technical Owl at Alchemy Labs. So um, we're most recently known for our VR exclusive game called Job Simulator, the 2050 Archives. And uh, just going to do a little bit of backstory. Uh, we also, in the VR space, are known for a game called Oculus, which is a skydiving base jumping game for Oculus Rift. Uh, we also made the port for the uh, Google Cardboard called Cardboard. You could see a, uh, a trend there. Um, we also, uh, for the past five years, have been developing original IP for mobile and desktop uh, and have released on Steam and iOS and Android Snuggle Truck. Uh, discourse and of course Jack Lumber. So uh, we're just going to jump right into it. Um, so to kind of give you a little bit of an insight on what we think um, good VR looks like, uh, I want to talk about why we picked Job Simulator as the game that we were going to work on. So to rewind a little bit, we just came off of uh, making Oculus and we got thinking what was our next title going to be? We were confident it was going to be some sort of VR only game, but what did that look like? So back then, it was pre-DK2 uh, VR time, so very primitive, uh, no positional tracking. We had keyboard and mouse or non-track controllers to work with. So how do you interact um, in that kind of world? Um, most experiences were passive, either gaze-based or using a keyboard, mouse, or non-track controller. Um, so things were a little bit limited. So after going through a lot of different types of like prototypes and different thoughts of what we wanted to build, we came to the conclusion that nothing was good enough. There was nothing we really wanted to build. There's got to be more. Yep. And that was until we saw the light. Uh, in 2014, uh, Valve invited us to try their room demo, which was um, at Steam Dev Days. And so that was the inside out uh, fiducial marker tracked room where you had full room scale and uh, were able to walk around uh, a large open space and inspect things up close. You can get down on your knees. You could lay down on the ground. You could uh, move all around the space. And it was, um, I, I, I was describing it, and I heard other people describing it as an almost religious experience when it comes to VR. Um, and we felt really privileged to have been uh, able to try that so early. And, um, but the first thing we thought when we came out and kind of got our bearings was, looking around is great, but we really need our hands in VR. Um, the problem was, when is there going to be a consumer timeline that allows us to track our hands in VR and to have uh, people able to use these um, their inputs, their natural inputs of their hands. Turns out, all three of the big major players right now uh, in VR are doing uh, motion-controlled, hand-tracked, one-to-one, absolute track controllers, which is awesome. Um, and so we think truly that standing VR combined with the ability to have track controllers is what makes VR VR. And you need to have both. Um, and it's an amazing experience to get those two combined. Uh, before we go too far into our, the ideology of, of what we're making. Uh, we should just kind of describe what Job Simulator is. Um, in the future, in 2050, the robots have taken all of our jobs. And so uh, they were also nice enough to build this simulator so that we don't forget what it was like to job. And so you could put on this headset and you can go in and you can see what was it like to be a gourmet chef and now extinct uh, profession or a convenience store worker. But and the so robots didn't quite get everything right. Their research wasn't fantastic. So some things are a little bit off. Yes, just a tad. So uh, let me just show you a quick uh, video of what we're building. Mm, looks acceptable. Thank you, human. May I have another? <laughs> Thank you. Why? Why are we building this? <laughs> why standing VR, really? So uh, we have a few reasons why we picked Job Simulator. So the first one is presence. Um, so the way it used to work, uh, so to explain what presence is, presence is when the low level part of your brain is like, I am in a space. This is real to me. The upper part of your brain is like, oh, it can be like, totally, this doesn't exist. I know that. But that low level part is like, I am there. That's presence. And what used to happen was it was really hard to get it. Um, we talked about getting it for seconds or minutes. Um, there was even Reddit threads about people talking about getting it for two minutes, and that was so exciting. Um, I 
I had it for you know, 30 seconds, maybe a minute at a time. But all of a sudden, when you have standing VR and you have tracked hands, now you almost get it for free as long as you don't mess it up. It's easy to mess it up, but as long as you don't do that, it is fantastic. Um, another thing is that the interaction is natural. So finally, we have this natural way of interacting with the world. Um, so as an example, when we started developing Job Simulator, one of the first uh, demos we did is we gave it to my grandma to try. And I told her, grab the controllers, just click the triggers to grab, release to release. That's all there is to it. She jumped in and was able just to make soup like nothing. She had never played really any games before. And now we have this, uh, this medium that we can let anybody with any skill level interact. Um, so in Job Simulator, we just use one trigger uh, button and one secondary button occasionally. That's it. There's two buttons in all of Job Simulator. Everything else is governed by your hands. So um, we kind of divide VR into two different camps, the passive and the active camp. So in the passive camp, that's generally observing. So you spend most amount of your time observing the world around you, looking around. Um, we think this can sell people on VR. People are like, yeah, this is going to be the future. But we're not sold that it is going to be what brings people back to VR over and over and over again. What we think is active VR is going to do that. So active VR is the ability to walk around, interact with the world, touch it, manipulate it, all that fantastic stuff. Um, so once you've had your first really good active experience, it's really hard to go back to passive. Um, you want to use your hands. You want to move really close to things, walk around stuff. Um, so that's why at Alchemy, we're focused on active, because we think that that is kind of the holy grail. Um, so the next big section is tracking. Um, this on the surface doesn't seem um, incredibly important, but when it comes to game design, it is very, very important. So there is a couple different types of tracking methods. Um, the first one is lasers. So these, that's a picture of a base station. Um, what it does is it shoots a laser grid across your room, and then the HMD, the head-mounted display, picks up those laser hits, and same with the controllers. And then using timing as it goes across the surface, it's able to de determine the position in 3D space of either your head or the controllers. Um, this has some big advantages, like it has low CPU load, because essentially it's just timings, and that's what computers do really well. Um, base stations also don't need a connection to the computer. All they need is power. You just plug them in, let them go, because they're dumb. The uh, interpretation happens at the uh, head-mounted display unit um, level or the controller level. Um, one of the downsides is that la uh, reflections are bad essentially because lasers like to reflect off of other surfaces. The second method is a camera or cameras. So this uses vision processing, um, either infrared or visible light, um, to determine your position in 3D space based on some dots on the, uh, on the headset or the controllers. Um, this has some downsides, like other bright lights can cause interference. Um, one of the challenges is that the cameras require a direct connection to that computer. So unlike the base stations, you have to wire these directly to the computer. So as you place these cameras further apart, you end up having to have longer wires go to your computer from them. Um, so when it comes to coverage, so coverage, I'm talking about the tracking volume that you're allowed to be in. Um, the placement of your trackers is incredibly important. Um, so with the Vive, it will ship with two laser base stations um, that you put on your walls uh, near the ceiling at 180 degrees apart from one another. Um, PlayStation VR, it will use one forward-facing camera facing towards you, and Oculus will ship with also with one forward-facing camera. Um, they've shown um, some touch demos using two um, forward-facing cameras, um, so we don't know what will ship when touch ends up uh, ends up being shipped. Right. So all this discussion of uh, tracking uh, leads to the issue of occlusion, which is uh, when something is occluded by another thing, you're going to lose tracking of that item. And that is the most frustrating and most terrible thing in all of VR. Um, if you lose tracking, especially on your head, uh, or if you lose tracking on your hand, it feels like the whole world is falling apart. Um, and it's much easier to lose tracking on your hand than it is your head. Uh, but you can have, if you lose your head, you're going to have nausea. There's all these things. So we're trying to prevent um, occlusion at all costs. So to kind of describe the various tracker setups, we've got the first method, which is a single tracker facing you from the forward direction. Now, by definition, if you've got a camera in front of you and you've got this frustum extending out from that camera, that means you have a limited lateral movement of it, uh, afforded by that space. And so that's just based on the tracker FOV. Um, that also means that uh, you can see in this little diagram that the red area is areas of occlusion. And so there's a large occlusion zone for your hands. Now, uh, obviously, I'm facing forward in that little uh, animation. So everything's good. Both hands are lit up blue. They're tracked. 
But if I turn past 45 degrees, it's possible that my right hand starts to occlude my left hand. So as far as the camera coming in, based on the height of my hands, I could pass by. And depending on the quality of your dead reckoning or whatever, it might feel like it hitches or you have some problem there. Um, so the other way that you can set up trackers is if you have a two tracker setup, you can, this is what uh, Oculus Touch demos have been showing, is that they separate two trackers high up on the wall and have them face down toward the center of the room. Um, and you can see here we've got another color in our diagram. The orange is actually uh, an OK state. It just means that one camera can't see the item, but all you need is one camera to track that item and you're good. Um, you can see that once you've got two cameras that are separated by a distance, you've got more lateral movement. Now the player can walk uh, much farther to the left and right and walk around kind of a larger space. Um, and even if you're partially occluded, you're OK. Uh, but you, and you've decreased the amount of occlusion once you've got these two vantage points. But you still have a, a triangle, uh, and you can see here through this little uh, demonstration, you still have to worry about controller occlusion. And that's the problem that not a lot of people, I think, are, are thinking about, is that after you start turning to 90 or past 90, you're going to increase the amount of possibility of losing a tracked hand, even with the two cameras in the forward direction. So um, the other way to set up trackers is to have two trackers separated by 180 degrees. So that means you have two opposing trackers. If you put one in each corner, uh, that prevents almost all cases of occlusion. Um, and what's really important is that you have full 360 rotation of both your hands and your head. So no matter where I go, my body is actually not going to block my controllers because at all times I'm going to have more than uh, greater than zero trackers hitting that item. It does require a significant amount of setup to get this going, uh, because now you've separated your, uh, your devices and you have to wire things back. Um, but what's really key from a design standpoint when you're making games is I don't have to care about where forward is in the world. I don't need to keep directing the player, oh, make sure you keep looking ahead, never turn around backward. Um, when you can lose that concept of forward, you can get people lost inside of VR and it creates a really amazing experience. Um, which I guess leads us to our little uh, joke sections interspersed throughout of things that are not the future anymore. Not the future, coffee tables. Let's all just agree, let's get rid of them. They're no, of no use to us anymore. Um, so because you can lose tracking, you have to design for it. So as Alex mentioned earlier, uh, 360 head tracking is totally something that all setups support. And the reason for that is it's really hard to occlude your head. Literally, I have to put both my hands up in front of my face to occlude, even if I turn around back, because um, most headsets have some sort of way of tracking uh, when you're facing opposing to the uh, tracker, if you have a single or dual tracker in the front. But 360, when it comes to controller tracking, that's another, uh, another thing. So not all setups support that. So you have to design your play spaces to afford interactions in a solid tracking area. So when designing for non-360 controller tracking, um, it's very key to not put interactables directly behind you, because that's the worst area for occlusion. Um, it's really magical to be able to turn around and do stuff directly behind you, but if you don't have support for that, don't put things there that you want to interact with. Um, but you also can't make that area behind you seem dead, because people are going to totally turn around, and it doesn't want to be just like black void. Um, we've run into things where we had something on a wall, and it seemed like it was something that was kind of inert, but people wanted to interact with it. It's like, okay, we're going to kind of design it a little bit differently so people don't want to touch it with their hands and lose tracking. Um, so also avoid two-handed interactions at pure 90s, um, particularly when you've got your hands like this, uh, because what ends up happening is almost everybody ends up lining those hands up at one point or another. So this was kind of one of those things that surprised us. Um, floor level interaction is incredibly magical. Um, so what ends up happening a lot of times in our kitchen, our, our gourmet chef demo, is that people will knock stuff on the floor. So something will roll off the table, it'll fall on the floor, and they'll bend over, and they'll grab it, and they'll put it back, and then they have the moment of, I just did what I would have done in real life, and it worked in VR. Um, this is pretty fantastic. Um, but it's not without its limitations. So you have to be careful, because floor-level interaction can be very fatiguing. If I'm constantly having to bend down over and over again, that can become very tiresome. Um, also, not all tracking setups support this. So it depends on the field of view of the camera and where it lines up with the floor. Um, so if you're planning on supporting all the platforms, um, be careful relying on this as like a core mechanism in your game. So on the opposite side of that coin is ceiling height. Um, 
we recommend to avoid this. Uh, there's too many different variables at play. So there's different player heights, um, different ceiling heights. Uh, I think a lot of these will be, end up being set up in people's basements, and basements are notoriously low. Um, also, whenever you have to put your hands up above your waist, this becomes fatiguing. Over your head is much, much worse. You can only do this for a very limited period of time. Um, and you also can get into questionable tracking zones also because of the FOV, because sometimes the cameras are pointed downward, so you lose some of that. Um, so we just think overall, just kind of avoid that um, altogether. Um, so one of our developers, uh, Graham, he's our tallest developer, um, he runs into this problem occasionally. That's a ceiling. The ceiling is that low? <laughs> yeah. You gotta adjust your original <laughs> yeah, So yeah. Uh, it's really easy to get lost in VR and not realize where you actually are in 3D space. I'm lucky that I have this drop ceiling because in a lot of my experimentations, I've smacked into it and luckily it just kind of pops up and out of the way. But uh, yep. on that note, another thing that's not the future: ceiling fans. Let's just let's just get rid of those. They're a death trap. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we've been talking about uh, tracking and um, another thing to worry about and and. Um, thing to think about is establishing trust with the user about where their tracking works and doesn't work. Um, and so users, when they're in VR, they're just having an absolutely fantastic time and, and going nuts. And they don't have to want to have to think, am I approaching a real world wall? Am I going to hit a chair that someone put there? It's, it's so far out of, uh, out of their brains in the moment that you just need to establish this level of trust that they're safe where they are. Um, and so they shouldn't be worrying about, A, running into a wall and possible tracking loss, like I said. And uh, Valve has actually made great strides with their chaperone system, which you could see here in this little uh, video, um, which is from our friends at Stress Level Zero. Uh, you could see when the hand approaches uh, the boundary of that, that setup they've made, which in this case, they're getting dangerously close to monitors and other expensive equipment. Uh, you could see that in VR, the player sees um, kind of a virtual boundary that comes up and is telling them, hey, you're approaching a uh, a point in, in this uh, game world where you're getting alignment to a real wall or real boundary in real life. So uh, we hope that all platforms build in some kind of solution that is similar to how this is working to basically uh, help with establishing trust with the user and that they know that if they don't go too far, they would completely lose tracking and, and hit a very nauseating um, frame skip. Yeah, trust is a really important thing because once you lose trust, people lose presence because they're constantly having to be in two worlds at the same time. Um, so moving on uh, to the topic of level design, uh, kind of want to talk about the concept of locomotion. So uh, to us, there are three valid types of locomotion. Type number one is to use the actual physical space afforded by the room that you're standing in, so real world space only. Um, number two is, the, is teleporting. So you could point where you want to go outside of your bounds and say, I want to go there, and it would pop in one frame, not lerp. Uh, pop to that new location, and then you can kind of point wherever you want to go and, and point around, which is a way to do it. But um, usually when you start doing that, you're going to start discouraging the, the concept of moving around again. There's another way to teleport where you try to integrate real world space uh, once you've done that pop motion and kind of encouraging that uh, larger movement after you've teleported. Notice there's no number four, which is using an analog stick to push you around the world, because we feel like that is poison for early VR, and that uh, a large percentage of people are going to have a lot of trouble with motion sickness, especially yaw rotation and moving around. Um, there's, just, there's been a lot of studies done. It just feels bad for a lot of people. So we're focusing on uh, real world space games only. So, Alchemy is trying to build games that work really well in small spaces. Um, it's really easy to pick up. Again, Devin's grandma is able to play our game. Uh, it doesn't break presence because you're not doing anything that might break presence. Uh, it doesn't disorient because you're not trying to rotate or move your world in one frame and then, oh, where am I? How, how have I moved in what scale? Uh, and the only thing is that it's very hard to design games that fit within this notion of I am uh, going to be in this smaller space. So I guess that leads to uh, how do we go ahead and design games that, uh, that will kind of afford that space? And how do I design my virtual space to, to match with what room I have? So um, we've been designing standing VR spaces like we would design a real space. Uh, so we have our work surfaces at reasonable heights. Um, we've taken a look at ADA height, counter heights and things like that. Um, very low areas, like we mentioned. Uh, we're trying to have uh, small amounts of floor level interaction and small amounts of uh, high up interaction and for you know uh, fatigue and also other ergonomic factors, which we'll go into ergonomics in a bit. But um, 
really we're building spaces that afford movement in the, uh, in the track space. So people will stop at that table. They'll stop at that physical barrier. So you can see here, there's an image. Uh, we've got a green outline of where the, the foot traffic area is in our, uh, in our space. And imagine that the world is a bit larger, so you've got that area to reach out to the counter and things like that. But no one physically wa continues walking through those barriers. There's nothing there. There's absolutely nothing in front of the person, but they will stop 100% of the time, or 99.5% of the time. And the 0.5 is a developer trying to prove that they can walk through something. It is so magical. In fact, I've had people do the demo, and then someone mentioned, oh, I could have just walked through something. And then the other person was like, no, you couldn't. It would have stopped you. <laughs> and I, how do I stop you in real life? And then, oh, yeah, it's just, it's so, people are not used to walking through yeah. geometry in the real world. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Humans are bad at it. Yep. Um, so, but you also want, don't want to design in a way that makes people feel boxed in. If, for example, we had limited the entire world of this convenience store to have physical walls at our boundaries, it would feel like you're playing in an elevator. And so you want to have kind of that low barrier, which is saying, here's my physical movement boundary. And then you have the larger outside world, which you could use different interactions, like throwing things into the distance or dealing with, like in this customer, uh, in this setup, we have customers coming up and asking for hot dogs and uh, slushies and things like that. Yeah. On that note, also, um, we talked about the chaperone system. When there's like a grid line comes in when you get close to the end. We design our spaces so that you don't have to think about that, that we actually build those spaces so they fit inside of that. Mm -hmm. So you never actually even run into that uh, environment. And it just comes to designing our spaces. Yeah. We hope to never show the blue lines if we can't, uh, can avoid it. Um, but what, like we were saying, it's absurdly convincing that solid objects are ap actually there for a number of reasons. Um, and so generally, you as a designer don't have to worry about people attempting to walk through solid objects. You don't have to worry about people usually trying to jam their face through walls to attempt to see what's on the other side. Although just watch out for uh, feeling like it's a good idea to put some weird Easter egg behind a wall. Because if someone sees that and then does that, you're now rewarding the concept of breaking the solid boundaries of the game. And once you've done that, uh, you can actually break someone's ability to feel like they're in that space now that they feel like they permeate all walls. So it's kind of like having no clip on and then realizing now I'm not in a real place. Um, so a great story uh, would be our friend Itai, who uh, was playing Job Simulator, and he had uh, the Vive on, and he's in the kitchen chopping stuff, and he finished his demo, and he goes, man, that was so much fun, guys. You did such a great job. And he put his hands forward onto the metal virtual table that's in the kitchen and let go. And so he just dropped our controllers from a four-foot height onto a concrete floor because he was so sold. And this is a, a guy who's been developing games for a long time. He's so sold that that table is really there that he was merging kind of the real world of, like, I'm going to put these plastic controllers down that Devin and Alex paid a lot of money for. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to just drop them on the ground. <laughs> so it might seem a little bit funny that that could even happen, but it still happens to me to this day. I've on numerous occasions tried to put down real controllers on a virtual table. So um, when you're designing your spaces, you have to think about movement. Um, so for example, in this example, we have a uh, refrigerator on the left side and this plate where you put your food on the right side. Um, this encourages movement laterally across the scene, um, back and forth. Um, this pr uh, prevents people from standing still, which is something you try want to try to avoid because it's kind of boring and it introduces fatigue. People aren't used to standing very rigidly. Um, so that kind of helps with that and actually makes the experience more fun. So something I'm very passionate about is floors. Um, <laughs> floors in um, human scale VR are incredibly important and something that's easily overlooked. Um, so accurate floor height is very important. People have a very good sense if they're too tall or too short. Um, so you have to make sure that floor is actually aligned with the real world floor. Um, this helps with things like grounding. Um, so for example, in a game uh, called Sky World, originally, so it's this tabletop game that you walk around, originally it was just empty space underneath you. Um, and they found that people stopped moving around. They just kind of stood there and kind of leaned a little bit. Um, so what they ended up doing was put clouds, dense clouds, at flat, uh, floor level. And then all of a sudden, people started walking again. Um, this helps that grounding, that feeling safe in that space, um, which ends up encouraging movement. It also prevents you from smacking controllers into floors. So if you don't have a floor there or the floor is misaligned, people will sometimes try reaching through where the actual physical floor is and smack their controller into the ground. So also, um, <laughs> in seated VR, the, the concept of recentering makes a lot of sense. Um, in standing VR, it does not. And the reason is the floor is in one spot. 
that cannot be recentered. Your real world floor is right there. So also because you're in a tracked space, you're also in the center of the room. The center of your physical room does not move. Um, so when it comes to uh, setting up your worlds in Unity, set them up so that the center of your tracked volume is at the floor zero, zero, zero. So if you put a cube there, it should be halfway through the floor, right beneath you in the center of your room. If anybody tells you not to do that, they are wrong, categorically wrong. Don't listen to them. So now that you have to think about um, getting people to move around, you also have to think about real world room sizes. So not everyone's going to have the exact same amount of space to devote to this. Um, so a very common thing that people have uh, said to me is, oh, couldn't you just scale the room to fit? Um, the problem with that is that you understand scale very well, and you have to have scale in VR exactly correct. The human brain is so good at determining if things are off when it comes to scale that they did a study and they took a Coke can and they scaled it up and down 10%, and humans were able to go, yes, that is completely incorrect and something is wrong. So you have to make sure right from the very start when you're designing things, you design things to scale, which means that when you're trying to design different room sizes, you can't just stretch and shrink your room. So in JobSim, um, what we end up doing is we actually build new um, custom versions for every room size that we want to support. So we have a bunch of different room sizes that we've built, and we actually customize each one. Um, because not only do we need to like, bring some walls in, some counters in, change the different sizes and stuff like that, we have to reposition items. Um, because for example, in the track space, if you don't have tracking right behind you, and we have in one of the setups something behind you, we have to move that somewhere else that's more appropriate. So that means that we actually have to go through and design each, uh, each room setup um, specifically for that use case. And and what we did in Unity to kind of help us out is we built this custom tool that allows you to toggle between the different room sizes and reposition objects um, on the fly to be able to kind of save that out um, to, to produce the overhead of having multiple different scenes that are kind of encouraging duplication. So this is kind of the uh, most important, uh, the meat of this talk. It's controllers and hands. So this is the most exciting thing for me. Yep. Next to floors, of course. Next to floors, yeah. <laughs> Um, so there's a big difference between the concept of hands and seeing my own hands in VR. Um, and so there, if people are referring to it as hand presence, is when uh, your hand in real life, whether you're gripping a controller or using some vision to figure out where your hand is, uh, it registers as being your actual real hand. So the amount of latency, the amount of offset, it just should really feel like you. And if you take off the headset and look back, your hands are aligning and registering, and that's hand presence. Um, and with the Razer Hydra, which was a device that was way ahead of its time and really was not meant for VR and then kind of got adopted, we never ever hit hand presence. Um, you always felt like you were controlling someone else's hands because they never registered as your own. So it was like you were driving some other set of someone else's hands. And that was, it was OK to a sense that you could develop some things and get used to that. But you never felt the concept of hand presence with that device. Um, but with the three major players doing one-to-one -one absolute tracked um, positional track controllers, you can get hand presence on all three. And they all work in the same way, which is fantastic. They all use one-to-one -one absolute uh, tracking, and they all are within the same tracking space as your head. So everything is perfectly aligned. If you want to iron sights something, it's going to be correct because it's, it's just right. That's how it works. Um, also, all the controllers have uh, triggers, which means that, and a couple extra buttons that you can assign to things, which means we've hit a magical moment where we have alignment am among a number of platforms and we have a standard. And so we could build something for all the platforms um, and it will just work without needing to redesign a whole new scheme for how you uh, interact. Now, with one to one hand tracking, um, you've got so many actions being distilled uh, into one motion. Uh, degrees of freedom with one hand. So we've kind of taken all the buttons that we used to assign to various things, and all these actions, like crouching and leaning and, and doing all these things and holstering, and it's now just nothing. It's, we've hit the button singularity. We just have this hand, and we can do things with it. And that's how real world works. Uh, you have a natural and easy to use and intuitive control scheme, and we should use that. Um, and that means now that since there's so many degrees of freedom, that means there's a lot of possibility space to be working in. Um, you can't just test every button on your controller and now you've hit all the permutations. The permutations are uh, infinite. So um, that brings us to how do I actually show what my hands represent in VR? Uh, you have a couple choices. So we see there's three major ways to do this. Number one is to use an actual CAD model of the controller that you're using. 
um, and bring it into VR and have it align perfectly with the controller that you're holding, which means that you're just going to see this plastic wand that you're holding and, and look at it, and that works. And, and you'll see them floating in space. Um, the other way is to show, basically remodel that controller, kind of use its, um, its positioning and its rotation and everything, but make something more IP appropriate. So if you were making a magic game and you had a magic wand, and that was the same shape-ish and it aligned, but you had something that kind of fit the theme. Uh, the other is to just show hands. Um, and all three have pros and cons, and it really depends on your content. Um, but for Job Simulator, we chose hands, because the core of the game and what it's really all about is about near field manipulation, being able to pick up things, grab, stack, toss, and all that. And so hands are our most important element, and we wanted to be able to show the articulation. But uh, we can't articulate on that level because we're holding wands. And so you can't see that your pinky turned 12 degrees this way or that way. So we've gone with a, uh, a cartoony version of what our hands look like. And so we've done these glove hands. Uh, they're oversized a bit, but they're not too large to make it feel like you have uh, boxing gloves or mitts that lower your ability to uh, articulate and grab in the world. Um, and also something to watch out for is creepy realism of hands. Uh, this is a video of when we were developing early on, and we had brought the uh, Sixth Sense Hydra hand directly into Unity and had it uh, aligned. And so here's Devin seeing that in VR. <laughs> what is <laughs> you can't see it because you're not there, but it is the creepiest, weirdest thing. You've got this strange bump map on it and these like veiny man hands. It's just super gross. Uh, so the cartoony way, that works really well for us. Um, so now that we have this natural input, we don't want to mess it up. So it's really easy to fall back on old strategies of like mapping inputs to different buttons. We have this natural movement. We can move your hands around and interact. Let's use that. Let's leverage that. So yeah, something that some people say, well, how, do I, how do I lean, right? And it's like, well, you just you lean. That's how you lean now, because now we have this natural input, which brings us to our next thing of something else that isn't the future, the crouch button. <laughs> It's gone. Gone. Say goodbye. <laughs> so, <laughs> so dealing with hands, um, one of the things that we learned really early on is to not show anything beyond the wrist. So once you get past the wrist, this is the point that we don't know exactly where your body is. So up to that point, we know exactly because of one-to-one -one tracking, but beyond that, it becomes flaky. So a lot of people thought maybe you could use IK to kind of solve for that, because that kind of works. Um, except it doesn't in VR, because your brain is so good at, at proprioception, you know exactly where your body is to incredible detail, that in the moment that that's off even a little bit, it just destroys the experience, it is very, very creepy, and it just doesn't feel that great. Um, but so what ends up happening is, if you look at images, of our hands, and they're just like floating, right? It seems a little odd, but once you're in VR, they don't seem odd at all. Um, your brain kind of fills in the gaps of what's there. Um, so there's one thing that we kind of learned in VR, it's much better to show no data than wrong data. Um, and so that's just something that we kind of learn and keep applying over and over and over again. Yep. So now that we have these hands, what do we do with them when we're interacting? So right now, there's two major options that we're kind of seeing come out. Um, the first one is to keep your hands visible at all times. Um, so two examples here are the gallery and London Heist. Um, so what they end up having is grab stances uh, for everything that you're interacting with. So as you get close to something and you go to interact, that item will lerp into your hand in the correct rotation and line up with the grip stance of that hand. Um, the reason you have to do this is because otherwise you get interpenetration. You don't want a book all of a sudden lerping inside of your uh, inside the geometry of your hand, because that feel, feel, feel really bad. But that means you have to set up all the different grips of every single object that you're interacting with. Option two, uh, which is something that we kind of discovered almost by accident, um, was that just turn off the hand. Um, so on the surface, this seems really odd. Um, and watching it in 2D, this seems weird. Wouldn't this be really jarring? Um, we discovered a few things. So this is very, very flexible um, because we don't have to set up all these grip stances for the actual hand itself and the objects, which allows us to implement new uh, interesting interactions at a much faster rate. Um, but also, no one really notices it in VR. Um, I did some uh, research in running people through Job Simulator and then asking them questions after. Um, about 90% of people never noticed that their hand disappeared. Um, their brain was just filling in the gaps. And so here's why we think that is the case. So in this video here, you can see that 
the moving the hand back and forth and then grabbing that tomato. So as we talked before, um, with the controllers being locked where your hand is, you get this one-to-one -one hand presence. Um, so what ends up happening is when your hand disappears at the same moment that you actually grab that object, as long as that object is locked to your hand, it is a stand-in for that. So now you have one-to-one -one tracking, on this case, on that tomato. Yep. So tomato presence. We should all adopt that term. Even if your game has no tomatoes in it, we should just go with it. I think it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the other thing uh, to mention is how do we have the world uh, show its affordances of what is interactable? Uh, in Job Simulator, uh, because we're doing a more toward cartoony uh, style game, we're able to actually highlight interactable items that get near the hands. Uh, so based on a distance check, we can, we can show that. So you can see on the drawer handle there. Uh, but it, we're actually only highlighting the parts of items, the, the sub-portions of items that afford interaction. Uh, and that tells the user a lot about the world and how it, it can be manipulated. Uh, so it's really important kind of um, uh, logic that's going on there. Um, Hyper-realistic games are likely going to avoid highlight states in VR because uh, when it looks so amazing with PBR rendering and then uh, your handle lights up, I think it's going to have this weird discordant feeling. So they have to, you know, by art style definition, they're changing how the uh, affordances work in the world. Um, so like, for example here, knobs, levers, and drawers. Um, fixed items that move on a track is a very complicated thing, even though it seems like it would just be a simple, you grab it, you pull it, you're done. Um, so obviously, that drawer only works on one axis. You have a single locked axis. But in London Heist, because they're snapping their hand to the handle, that means that now, as they pull, as you start to uh, stray from that straight line, you're disassociating your hand from the real hand, which I'm going to show in a second. Um, so when you have your visible hand, you're going to have to d disassociate your hand uh, from your real hand. And it starts to decay your hand presence, because you're not aligned anymore. Um, if you do hidden hand uh, method that we're using in Job Simulator, there's no disassociation between VR hand and real hand because you actually hide the hand. And now you just kind of get drawer presence because you're seeing where the drawer is. The only negative is that you get less reference as to where your hand is because it's gone. And you're, uh, you, you do have to break from some area. So if I start pulling and I'm still grabbing the drawer, as I get to some distance check, it's going to pop out. And then now I'm going to see my hand again. Yeah, that's why in this example, the, that drawer handle is very small. We found that the smaller that area is, the closer your hand has to be to that location, which kind of helps with hand presence. Yeah. So I guess this explains it a lot better, is that in the real world, when you move your hand and you're holding an item and you hit a thing, you're going to have uh, an actual physical item stopping you. And so you're going to get that haptic feedback, and you're, that's it. Solid object. Great. When you're in VR, you have one way to go, which is to just completely let things permeate through solid objects. So that's the ghosting method, I suppose you could call it. So in this case, the sword goes right through the table. Now you've kind of lessened the concept that this table is a solid object. Uh, the other way to go would be to have the sword stop at the table. But then you, have, you see that you've now disassociated where your real hand is from where the virtual representation of your hand is in the game. And so when you lose those two, that's where the hand presence decays. What we've done in Job Simulator is an interesting merge of the two in that we've given all of our items full world collision, but they break out of their hand because they're jointed to the hand. And when there's enough uh, physics momentum smacking it out of your hand, it actually drops it. So that tomato feels really, really like it's in the world instead of if we were able to just move it through walls and through items. Um, so I'm sure that contributed some small amount to Itai's decision to drop my controllers on the ground is that that, that little decision there uh, helps to make that table feel more real. Um, and I guess kind of the overriding thought process of our UX design in the game is that feel trumps everything. Uh, in some games, depending on the art style or what you're going for, realism might override your decision for feel. Uh, and that's kind of what happens in uh, you know, high-end AAA games where they need to get everything to look correct. Um, but sometimes that realism gets in the way. And so being able to highlight state things in the world uh, is really, really helpful for feel. And so intuitiveness of interaction and feel drives almost every UX decision that we make. Um, and it also means that we don't know necessarily the decision until we try it in VR, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, the final element of, of uh, hand interactions to close this out is haptics. So all three of the major players have some uh, 
some type of haptic that you can apply to your controller. And there's two ways to use that strategically. One is pulse haptics, so basically firing an event to the controller to give it a bit of a buzz. Um, and it depends on the granularity of your haptics as to how you want to do it. You might be able to do curves or something that feels like a, like a shunt to your hand. Uh, when items break out of your hand, like in that video of the tomato smacking out of your hand, we do a haptic pulse. When you pick up an item, you actually also haptic pulse, but to a lesser extent. Uh, and on our to-do list is when you're smacking something with your hand, which permeates through items, when you make that connection, we will also haptic pulse to show you that you've just hit a real uh, item in space, which actually gives you a proprioceptive hint that, hey, that's a real object. Uh, and then also you can do it with, um, actually Yasser from Valve pointed this out in a great talk at uh, GDC Europe recently. If you have items that are out of your view, like your hands behind your back or something, you can haptic pulse to give attention that something in your hand is happening. So like if you had a phone in your hand as the UI element in the game, you could make it buzz, and then you go, ooh, something's happening, and then you'd pull it up in front of your face. So uh, it's a good redirection technique. On that note, um, if you have something in your hand, like say I had the tomato, a lot of times your hands are out of your own view because you just know where they are. If you turn and you bumped it like, into a table and knocked it out of your hand, you would get some buzz there, so you would know that, oh, I just knocked this thing out of my hand. Yeah. Um, yeah, the other method of haptics, again, Yasser was talking about, and we use in, uh, in our game, is distance-based haptics, which is really interesting. Um, basically, you set it up so that as you move some units, like every centimeter or every quarter centimeter, you do a haptic pulse. And so as you move through the world with your hand, you get this feeling of texture or friction as you move through the space. So what we're doing is we're using that for drawer pulls. So when you grab onto the handle and start pulling, you could feel it go like click, 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 click as you move slower. Um, same with the hinge rotation on the uh, slushy machine. As it does angular ticks, we're doing uh, haptics there, and it really feels like you're pulling something that has resistance. So that's a combination one. So it's tick, 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 and when you get to the end and it starts flowing slushy, then all of a sudden your controller vibrates a little bit more to give you a little bit more uh, indication of what's going on in the world. Um, so, affordances. Uh, so this is something when we jumped into VR I didn't think a lot about, um, but it has become uh, a very important part of Job Simulator. Um, so it's all about uh, fulfilling the user's assumptions, what they think is going to happen in the world. Um, so for example here, we have a picture of the pot. So this is a soup pot on the counter. You make soup in it. We just got a 3D modeler to make a pot and we didn't think too much of it. And then we had people run through it, and one of the first things people would do is go over to the pot with both their hands and try to grab onto the handles and lift up the whole pot. And we're like, but we don't want that to happen. Um, and so we realized, oh, what if we just took the handles off the pot? And then all of a sudden, people stopped doing that. Um, so it becomes, um, it used to be that you could more willy-nilly design your uh, 3D models, make them more realistic, and just model them like that. Now you have to think a lot about, now that you have direct interaction in the world, what they look like and what they actually afford. Right. It's kind of like back to the uh, adage of never put a door handle in a game that can't be, of that door that can't be opened. So. Uh, we're kind of getting back to that and needing to realize that uh, anything that's there, people are going to expect it works in the way that it, the object affords. Uh, a good, another good story about that is the plate. Um, so we put the plate in, and we were working on our first version of the kitchen, and uh, my wife Beth was playing the game, and uh, she picked up a plate off the counter and threw it on the ground, and it just kind of sat there, <laughs> and she goes, this game is crap. <laughs> and so the first thing that I did was add make plates break to the top of the to-do list, because <laughs> Those testing moments where we realize we have, uh, we're, we're blind to what's going on, those are really important. Um, so another one is um, things that afford certain actions and their possible negative ramifications in the game. So one of the early things we added uh, to the kitchen was a knife because everyone wants to play with knives in a kitchen. So we added knives and we added chopping. And so one of the first things people did was they grabbed that knife, went over to that carrot, and finally chopped it. And each one of those turns into a rigid body with a collider. And then everything starts vibrating, and then performance goes down. And it's just like, oh no, we can't do that, right? But the answer isn't remove the knife, because everybody wants knives, but we clearly can't support that. So what do we do? Um, so we decided to use the game itself to do something funny. Um, so whenever you cut something, it does split. It does give that a thing that people expected. But the knife also shatters. And JobBot makes some comment about how knives are too dangerous for humans to operate. Um, so this gets people that smile and gives them uh, that, that knife afforded to do something, and they got some interesting action out of it. 
So it becomes incredibly easy to not see um, some things that are afforded in that space. Um, play testing is incredibly important. Uh, we watch for it all the time. Luckily in VR, because people are standing and moving around and doing things, you can watch people's facial expressions and hand gestures um, to notice if all of a sudden they were trying to do something that didn't afford something. They'll reach for, towards something and then go, oh, and then it's like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I totally understand what you were actually trying to do. So we do a lot of play testing and then take tons and tons of notes of what people were trying to do and what actually ended up happening in the game. It's also the hands are very expressive and people do this, uh, oh, screw it gesture, which looks like this, <laughs> like that. And you could see the hands, act if you even have a video of someone playing and you, you can't see their human avatar, human there, uh, you could see they go like, what, what is this? They're, the confused gesture. <laughs> you could see it even in VR with two, two plastic hands and, a, and no head, so. Um, so, I uh, also want to talk about the ergonomics uh, of standing VR. So, uh, I want to show you kind of a mock-up of a dystopian future back-of-the-box game for standing VR. Just let you soak that in. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very possible that there'll be some of these things, uh, you know, what size room are you allowed to have to play this game, or you can't, sorry, you can't if you're, you're not tall enough to play this game. Um, so we've been thinking about that a lot. Turns out standing height now, the, the player height actually matters. And we're talking about the actual size of the human doing the interactions. Uh, so a good story of how that affected um, gameplay was we had built, again, this example of the pot, which is part of the soup making part of the original Valve demo that we did. Um, and uh, it seemed OK because we had the counter heights fine. And, but it turned out that you had to reach into the pot and look in to see that there was something inside of it and then pull it out of the top because it's a solid cylinder and you can't just pull it from the side. And uh, a lot of developers had uh, small children play the game and they were taller than the counter height so they could do stuff. But when the soup was created in the pot and they needed to grab it out, they A, didn't know that there was something in the pot and B, couldn't reach over the top to grab it and then pull it back out. And so, um, Right now, it's an unsolved uh, thing, and we're just trying to make sure that we don't exclude too many, uh, you know, yeah. too many people from being able to play the game. In this, the solution ended up being with that pot was that we ended up making it shorter, but then that is less volume, so then we made it wider. Um, so that ended up yeah. allowing it to, to work and allow children to be able to, to play that. Yeah, it's a slight nudging type of thing. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned, building counter heights to a good average height was something that we had to experiment with and see where, where, sh where should that land. Um, a funny ergonomics bug is uh, Graham, I'll also pick on him as our tallest developer at Alchemy. Um, he was testing uh, a new job that we're working on and it turned out that everything was fine on his machine. And then when we were all playing it, we were seeing characters smacking into JobBot, the main character, uh, and having these bugs where when it collided, it was null refing, and we we're trying to figure out what's going on. And he's like, it doesn't do it on my machine, it doesn't do it on my machine. Uh, it turned out the, so JobBot, when he talks to you, from an empathetic standpoint, our design is that he floats at the height of your head. So if you're a shorter person, he actually, he, he goes up and down on the Y. So because he was so tall while he was playing, he was actually, the, the characters that were moving and hitting him, it was, he was so high that they were just going right under. And so he, we weren't seeing the bug on his machine because he was just that tall. Okay. So It's not just not my machine, it's not my human. Not my human. Yeah, which brings us to... The next thing, which is QA nightmare. Oh man, so VR QA, we do not envy your future selves because <laughs> now a single QA person can actually no longer test all the permutations of things that can happen in VR. Uh, there's just too many things driven by ergonomic differences and honestly, things that could play into the process of testing your game is getting people in that have uh, different age ranges than you know, than your average tester. You need different sized room parameters for where you're actually doing your testing. Uh, it could be that the life experience of what they understand as affordances in the real world play into the ability to open up the microwave or whatever it is because that appliance is not uh, commonplace in, you know, where they grew up. Um, differences in vision, differences in hearing, all these things are now inputs to the QA process, which uh, definitely is a complication. So I mentioned before um, my grandma playing for the first time. Um, we learned a very interesting thing uh, when my grandma ended up playing. So in the kitchen, there's this table in front of you, and we just kind of made it an arbitrary uh, depth. 
we didn't think too much about it. But what ended up happening is she was playing, a piece of bread fell to the far edge of the counter, so then she had to reach it. But she is shorter and she's older, so what ended up happening is she had to lean a long way over, and then she's used to bracing herself on the environment, so she put her arm down to brace herself on the table and almost fell. Um, so now we've thought about that a lot and make sure that we don't set up situations where you have to lean over things any distance, um, even if you're very short. Uh, something else we're seeing uh, from an ergonomic standpoint is uh, skill transference. So basically, if you have a skill that you could do in the real world, uh, it's very possible that it applies in VR, specifically uh, hand-eye coordination and ability to throw things accurately. So I guess uh, a good example would be a video here of me juggling in VR three tomatoes. Um, that shows the accuracy. Yes. Thank you. Keep it going. Keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Um, yep. So another thing to think about is the tether. So that cable that runs from the HMD to your computer. Um, for high-end VR, that's kind of there to stay um, for the near term um, due to a lot of factors. Um, but it's actually not as bad as I originally thought it was going to be in standing VR. Um, and there's a reason. So the reason is that it's generally under your feet. Um, and that ends up not being too bad. Um, I have logged hundreds if not thousands of hours in um, standing uh, room scale VR, and I have not tripped or had any issue with it, um, but you have to design for it. So, but one thing that people tell me all the time is, well, why don't you mount it on the ceiling above your head and that would be perfect and it's out of the way. And on the surface that seems like, oh yeah, that'd be kind of good. Um, it turns out it is not. Um, if you just have a headset, and that's all you have, it actually works all right. Um, except for something, it pulls up a little bit on the headset, which kind of breaks presence a little bit. But when you have tracked controllers and all of a sudden you have this thing above your head, the last thing you want is all of a sudden swinging your hand through a cable that's attached to your head. Um, so that ends up being the worst case. Um, having it on the ground underneath you um, actually isn't that bad. You just have to, you have to design for it. Yep. Which is not something I really thought of originally, but you have to think about quite a bit. So for example, the one thing you have to do a lot is discourage continuous 360 rotation. Um, so in the kitchen, we don't put anything ever directly behind you if you're in the center of the room. Um, the things that are behind you are either to your direct left, which is behind you, which is the microwave, and then to your left, uh, to your right behind you is the cutting board. And we try to not have any tasks that require you to do a complete full 60, that 360, that generally you want to turn back to front. Um, it takes a lot of um, our design to get that to work, but people don't realize it's even happening. And this prevents people from becoming tangled up in their own cord. Right. All right. Um, so finally, just kind of want to talk about the implications of building for standing VR and what's involved on the development side. So um, developing VR content that's standing is quite a bit of a uh, hassle. So imagine sitting at your desk. And then you've got your tracked headset and controller sitting in the middle of your room. So you have to get up, you have to go over to the location, you have to go put the headset on, and then you're probably going to have headphones that go on over that. Then I'm going to have to look at my controllers, which hopefully are tracked in VR space, and grab them with the headset on, do whatever minute test it was that I obviously failed at doing because you never get it right on the first try. And then you have to do everything. You have to unlatch in the reverse order. So you've got to put the controllers down. I have to take the headphones off before I can take the headset off and then put it down, go back to my computer, and then make the one-line change that I screwed up in Unity. Uh, it's pretty rough. Now, we, uh, we actually, it's a good story here, is we started doing this weird two-man setup where we could have, let's say, Devin was in VR, and we're trying to figure out, OK, how high should this table be, or we're trying to adjust some stuff. So I'm here driving in the Unity editor in play mode, and he's in VR, and he's saying, hey, can you move the table up a couple more inches? OK, a little more, oh, right there, that looks good. Or we just put a new prop in the world, and for some reason, our artist didn't build it to scale. So it's like, OK, let's get a judge of how big we actually want to make it. And so you're going bigger, bigger, smaller, cool. Commit that number. Um, and so that workflow, uh, well, it's terrible, but it's better than trying to do it yourself. And so we hope that these kinds of um, development workflows get a little better for VR. Um, and that kind of leads to the concept that in design, you have no clue what you're doing until you see it in VR. I, I'm very wary of people who claim to have a VR game design that they haven't proved out via a quick uh, test of their concept. Um, because we just, we don't have that 30 years of backlog of of game design experience to look back upon and say, hey, this worked in this previous game. We have nothing. We're starting fresh in a new fertile design space. And so you have to try everything. And you know, we're, we've been doing it for a couple years. And still, every single time, we go, that's a terrible idea. But let's try it, because we have no idea. Um, so yeah. 
So physics um, in Job Simulator is kind of a big part of it, and physics feels amazing at 90 hertz, uh, being able to interact with that world, um, but it is incredibly hard to work with. Um, with using hinge systems, so there's a lot of hinging in our game. Um, it has taken over a few man months to get that to actually work um, the way you want. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit challenging, unexpectedly. Um, yeah. So physics used to be good enough. Um, here's, here's a good enough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but in VR, things that are incorrect are obviously incorrect. Um, in, in Job Simulator, because the game's a little bit cartoony, we can get away with some physics acting up, but the more that you go realistic in your games, the more that physics could actually break presence and make that world feel less real. Um, so physics, I think, is going to have to, it's been kind of stagnant for the last little while, and I think a lot of companies need to jump in and do a lot more development on making more robust, more reliable physics systems. All right, um, and to close out the talk, a couple more things that we believe are not the future. Uh, number one, untracked pets. Totally not the future. They're going to ruin us. Number two, untracked chairs. <laughs> and finally, something that's definitely the future. Someone needs to get on this, tracked beer cozies. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>so, so yeah, it so, looks like we have about five minutes, so we can take some questions. Yep. Uh, and you can step There's up to the mic, microphone. I think, right there. There's one there, and that's it. So, microphone. I have a question about uh, hand tracking. Yep. Do you think there is ever going to be a future for some kind of wearable to more precisely individually track finger movements? So this is something that, so the question's about um, having individual finger tracking and like a glove or something like that. That's something that instantly people think about because they've seen a lot of movies that have that. The problem is that say I have a glove and I want to reach for an object and pick up a tomato, I have to kind of go like this and kind of stop um, or go like this. At least if you're holding on to a wand or something like that, you're ready in a grip stance, which when you have that object in your hand, it feels more like I'm grabbing something. So. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but I think until we end up having a system where you can have some feedback, like I can reach and it stops my fingers and stuff like that, um, I, I don't know if that's a, a fantastic avenue. Um, right. but, Although yeah. that's, that's our use case, and that's yep. the problem with building hand controllers, is that you have so many different use cases, and it's a compromise you know, trade-off game. And so if you were building uh, something that you were able to do sign language with, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be really hampered if you're having to hold a wand the entire time. So it really matters what you're doing. Uh, so there's two mics, so we'll go hop back to the back one. Yeah, so since uh, the playtesting is so important for the VR right now, uh, do you all have like a structured way of uh, going about uh, doing playtesting and getting data from that? Uh, it's, you throw people in. Um, people that have never done VR before are fantastic to work with because uh, you get to see the really interesting things. Um, it's challenging to use the same person more than once uh, because that kind of invalidates your data. And then just like normal testing, don't tell them anything. Be very quiet. Even if they're struggling for minutes at a time, it's, it's much better to sit them and let, watch them try to figure things out. The sad thing is that VR virgins will eventually become extinct. So we have testers for now. We'll see what happens in <laughs> the long, long game. <laughs> Could you tell us about um, any failed interactions or jobs that you guys tried out and was just awful? The, the um, sky. The, which one? The uh, window washing. Oh, yeah. Uh, we tried to make, uh, well, originally we, we said, oh, this would be great. You'll be on the 98th floor and you'll be a window washer on the side of a building and you had to uh, wash windows and then there were pigeons that came and you had to get them off before they crapped on your head. and. Um, it turns out the the sheer fear of being on uh, yeah, the heights, just no one could move and no one could progress. Uh, and so I have a mild fear of heights. And while I was building it, it was it was getting a little rough. So we <laughs> instantly abandoned that one. Uh, also, other things. There's so many things that we discount because there's no good haptic uh, reaction to doing it. So if you were to smack something with a long uh, baseball bat or whatever, and it was supposed to actually feel like it hit you're gonna lose so much because you could just swing your hand in all directions without it feeling uh, like it just permeates, which is why the, uh, the STEM demo of lightsabers is like the perfect demo because you have no resistance as you move through items. So uh, yeah, that's a lot of times we discount certain jobs because a lot of the things you're doing, or certain interaction, a lot of things you're doing is, is that you actually wanna feel that moment of, of hitting and it doesn't happen. So 
sometimes haptics that we have now are not good enough to solve that. Can you talk some more about the um, editor extension you have for resizing the room? Um, so it's a bit of a work in progress right now. Um, so the way it ends up working is uh, in the scene view, you have a little window and you can select which room size. We have a bunch of different configurations and then it draws this overview of the actual size of the room on top of that. And then through some crazy process, it records all the movements on all the transforms that you do and then saves that out as a separate data structure. So then at runtime, you can go and re-add those things. Um, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, I don't know what the solution is. We haven't built enough multi uh, setups, as multi like, room size setups yet to know what the good workflow is there. So, so let's once you get it figured out, will it be an asset in the asset store? Um, I don't know. I have to figure it out first. <laughs> <laughs> so have you done any actual research on how many people will be able to play the game? Because in my apartment, I will not be able to play it, which is terrible. I would love to, but do you have any numbers on like what people actually got at home? Um, a, a good, um, we, one of our developers actually develops out of a small apartment. And it works in his apartment, and he does development in his apartment. We just, we build different room sizes to kind of, uh, to tailor to whatever you got. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that you could find a space, um, as what's long as the, the coffee table goes. What's the smallest, like, right now for room? Well, so we're working with all of the major uh, platform owners to determine what their smallest size is for MinSpec for the hardware. So we're working within the bounds of another setup of a larger company where they're saying, okay, here's, here's the widest you can get on X platform. Or, here, you know, Valve might say, here's, here's the various sizes that we're going to support. Here's a small, here's a medium, here's a large. Uh, and they're defining that, and we are going to build to those specs. Okay. So they haven't really said too much about where, they're, where that's landed, and I'm sure they're probably doing a little more. We're just going to have to try it and see how many will buy it. So, like, yeah. Yeah, yep. All right, I think that's, we're out of time now, so. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.